Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Anastasia Kinigopolo, and I'm the director and curator of the Horseman Foundation. Our mission is to expand scholarship and appreciation of American art, but particularly works by artists who have been historically omitted from the canon due to their race, gender, or geographic locale. For those of you who are joining us from around the country and who might not be familiar with St. Louis, which is where we're based, uh, the Horseman Foundation and our premises are located on the traditional lands of the Osage Nation, the Missouri and the Illini Confederacy, who have stewarded this land for generations. The foundation actively strives to center the living history of indigenous peoples and to celebrate their historic and ongoing contributions to the region. And I'm very excited to welcome you all here to the second in our series of artist talks with Esteban Cabeza de Baca. Uh, this is a series of talks we're doing in conjunction with our online exhibition, Traditions and Transformations, Modern and Contemporary Native Visions from the Horseman Collection, which you can find on our website at thehorsemanfoundation.org. And we'll be taking a couple of questions after our talk. So just please take a look. There's a little Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And Feel free to enter any questions you might have. I'm gonna just very briefly introduce Esteban before we get started and we'll jump right in. Esteban Cabeza de Baca was born in 1985 in San Isidro, California. He's currently based in Queens, New York. His work employs a broad range of painterly techniques, which as we'll see incorporate layers of graffiti, landscape painting and pre-Columbian pictograph traditions in ways that confound the Cartesian single point perspective. He often begins his work in plein air, recasting the practice of landscape painting, which, as many of you know, is the preferred tool of colonizers, particularly in the American West. His recent exhibitions include Let Earth Breathe at Crystal Bridges, Nepantla at Garth Greenan Gallery, and Life is One Drop in Limitless Oceans at Concert by Weiphausen in the Netherlands. He's also been included in numerous group exhibitions, including Wasteland at the Drawing Center, Complexities of Unity at Yale University, and Plain Air, which is currently on view uh, and will be on view through February at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tucson. Esteban's work has been featured in Vogue, the Boston Globe, New York Times, the Brooklyn Rail, and a number of other publications. And he holds an MFA from Columbia University and the BFA from the Cooper Union. Esteban, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. It's so nice to be welcomed uh, to talk with you and, you know, as peers from Cooper Union get to share and exchange knowledge together today. So thank you so much for inviting me. And um, yeah, as you as you stated, I'm in Queens right now, uh, the ancestral home of the Lenape Nation. So um, I just wanted to give that land acknowledgement and to think about uh, the settler occupation of this land and possibly through how arts could change and remedy uh, where we're at right now. So um, I'm going to share my screen and just go through um, PowerPoint. Um, yes, yeah, so let's do full screen. Let's start. All right, great. So if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to ask it in the chat. Um, I, I'm a pr professor, so I, I enjoy interacting with my students, but also just with other artists and other uh, intellectuals. So please, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to, to go. Um, so in the introduction that Anastasia uh, gave, which is really great, she uh, mentioned how I'm an observational painter. Um, this is uh, me working out in New Mexico in 2020. Um, the way that I built up a lot of my surfaces is by initially going outside and developing um, my interaction with uh, my ancestral homelands in the Southwest. Um, for a while, I've been trying to develop the language around why it's kind of been so interesting for me. And I think for the clearest way to kind of explain it is to interact with history and the history of landscape painting and, and to really assert the significance of indigenous history that's been taken out of art history, but to also nullify my own ego when I go out into nature and to let it speak to me and help me guide me 
to subject matter or ways of working. Um, and also think about how some of these forms could exist out in three dimensions and be interactive with an audience. Um, my partner, Heidi Howard, um, her parents are um, specifically her mom, uh, Liz Phillips, a uh, sound um, arts electronics pioneer, uh, has been somebody that I've also been really inspired by because of that idea of interactivity with people and how can art, but also indigenous rituals and ceremonies be very in line with interactive art from a very old point of view or a very ancient point of view um, and potentially host life through uh, these different vessels as well too. So um, I'm gonna start at the beginning sort of at my family's timeline. Um, so one of my ancestors, Alvar Nunez Kostavaca uh, was part of the failed Panfilo de Narvaez expedition um in 1527 he was shipwrecked and one of the few survivors and was enslaved to native american tribes for about five six years and moving as you see in this map throughout the southwest and one of the ways he got his freedom was by performing faith healing rituals but then also introducing them to european ways of of life to help them cope and acclimate to colonization, um, but to also overcome it in certain ways. So what's not mentioned in his story and where I kind of come in is that he intermarried into or had relations with indigenous tribes throughout the Southwest um, and advocated for a grand alliance with Native American people to the Spanish crown. So that wasn't really popular um, at the time, but I think he kind of serves as like a model for me of just thinking of what could have been in the new world, but that that didn't happen because of uh, greed and uh, colonial conquest. Um, fast forward to uh, the 60s, the 1960s. So I was born in San Isidro, uh, San Diego area. And my, my dad was a security guard for Angela Davis, as you can see there, and then also a security guard for Cesar Chavez. And um, both my parents were organizers in the labor movement. And you know, with the election midterms that just happened yesterday, I think it's um, a sign that if we really nourish grassroots organizations that are uh, organizing around labor issues, that's really people-powered uh, progressive movements that we can actually use to strengthen uh, good causes in this country. So I guess for me growing up, kind of silently watching all of these discussions in my household growing up, um, I that was always imbued in me, this thinking of what, what can art do? And I think my parents always encouraged me by you know, looking at Picasso's Guernica de Diego Rivera or, or Frida Kahlo or, or even you know, the, the Mexican muralist, it was just a consciousness by going to like places like Chicano Park, that there's so much power through like public engagement and interaction um, that art has a, a valid part in imagining culture's future. Did your, Esteban, did your parents know you were, you were going, how, or I guess how, how young were you when your parents realized that you were going to pursue art as a career or as as think, part of your education I think they really pushed me because I went to like an arts public magnet school and just mm -hmm. to promote public schools over private schools um, it was a great way for me to get exposed to arts education uh, for free and so they they were really kind of seeing that as a strength I, I didn't start talking till I was five years old and one of the ways mm -hmm. they got me to start talking was um, making art so um, I think I've just been you know uh, art school brat since I was like <laughs> 10 years old. Um, yeah. Um, so this is this is uh, just right next to door to where I was born in San Isidro. Um, this is Tijuana. So every weekend we'd visit my family there and I'm actually going to go visit there for the holidays um, with my partner. And um, it's just been really influential in the way that I structured space and thinking about how the landscape but also 
the layers of information, whether it's hieroglyphic or graffiti or uh, more um, semiotic ways of thinking about stacks um, have, have been really crucial in the way that I thought about my work. But, uh, but then there's also this idea within uh, Chicano and Mexican culture of uh, rascuachismo, which is making do with whatever you have to creatively express an idea too. So that's, um, I'm gonna run through some of my influences um, quickly. Um, one of them is uh, Jackson Pollock on the left in his famous studio drip painting series of photos um, that I've kind of um, negatively pushed against. And then on the right is also um, Indian art of the United States curated by Frederick H. Douglas and Rene Harcourt from 1941 at the MoMA, which I'm pretty sure that Jackson Pollock saw and was influenced by, I think. Um, and just how, you know, indigenous subject, it, indigenous people are treated as subjects and almost like zoological animals performing something that's very sacred in a very public space is, you know, kind of profane in a way. So these are things that I'm trying to actively question within my own work and uh, take the drip and and the the touch of, of an artist to like a deconstructed level. Um, somebody that's been like a positive inspiring uh, inspiration in my life has been uh, John Quick to see Smith's work. Um, you're going to see this image pop up in the lecture again because I, I kind of sample it in like a hip hop way or like in a you know artistic way um, and redo it for my own specific um, concepts. But this is a fantastic painting and uh, Jean's a fantastic artist. Um, so much so that um, with my art classes, I teach uh, uh, Jean's Nomad Art Manifesto where nomad art is made with biodegradable materials. Uh, nomad art can be recycled. Um, but the last two are really interesting. Nomad art is convenient for countries which may be disbanding or reforming. Nomad art is for the new age of diaspora. And I guess I keep coming back to this with thinking about where we are with climate justice in this country, but also um, structural racism and violence. Like how can we make something that's not, that's more, for lack of a better description, nomadic and moves rather than being something that's so like cemented and, and more flexible and changeable. So I, I just really thought that this is a great uh, manifesto and a lot of my students love doing this assignment, so. Well, it's, uh, what, what's interesting to me about that specific notion of, of the new diasporic age is that that the notion of diaspora, I think for so many people around the world is just a regular part of their life. They, it's a part of their grandparents' lives, it's part of their parents' lives. And I think it's very recent in the US because of climate change, but also because of economic things that have been going on in this country that people are starting to grapple with this idea of diaspora as, as a thing that might be a part of their lives in a way that I don't think they have in previous previous generations. Yeah, I mean, I think for me and my people from indigenous parts of Mexico and like that diaspora, but then how that commingles with with uh, European migration mm -hmm. into this country and how these different forces of people moving and commingling with one another, but then also intermingling with indigenous identities from New Mexico. It's like, I, I think national boundaries, geographic man-made boundaries are just so outdated in that in some ways we're gonna see more of, of this high, I think in my opinion, more hybridity because of um, large geopolitical factors. So. Um, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I think that that's important to point out too. Um, I, I lived in Europe for a couple of years um, around uh, after the election of Donald Trump. Um, I was doing the Reichs Academy residency. So I, I finally got to Europe and go to places like the Louvre where I saw ancient American art encased in glass vitrines, which was really strange to me that I go so far away from my home and then I end up seeing it 
encapsulated and extracted for European audiences. So I think that was a big influence on my work. Um, and when I'd come back to the United States for like, you know, Christmas vacation or whatever, um, to visit my family, I, I would think about what were some of the things that that stayed behind or that couldn't be moved or couldn't be fit into a, a white rectangle or the, the white cube space, you know, and that, that's been something circular that I've been going back and back towards of, of petroglyphs, like, you know, the very advent of land art in the United States, something that can't be, you don't have an admission price that's exorbitant when museums should be for free, you go to these national mm -hmm. parks and they're accessible to people and they should really be protected and, and given back to some of these indigenous tribes because I think, you know, people sometimes don't take the right respect or, you know, it's, it's just ancestral knowledge that should be really protected and deemed sacred. So this is something that I've been thinking about and going to, and also just sitting in those ancient spaces has been something that has inspired me to kind of get out of my own ego, get out of my own way and really connect to something larger than myself um, through the process of painting. I think it's important, especially with petroglyphs to, for audiences to understand that seeing, seeing an image of a petroglyph and actually being in the space, and you certainly touched on this, are two wildly different experiences. To the point that people have said, you know, people that are quote unquote connoisseurs of petroglyphs but don't actually travel to the places are really just collectors of photographs. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting, for me, what's interesting is how your art sort of engages in that and attempts to, and correct me if I'm wrong, sort of encapsulate that experience outside of these environments. Well, I, I think of it as like, how do we expand the conversations around environmental justice, indigenous land claims, and then also just um, how we think about American history more and, and how do we use these, or, or like, how do we let these ideas that are imbued in the rocks, whether they're cosmological or based out of hunting or foraging um, patterns, change our mindset a little bit so then it's less extractive but more we extend out a new relationality with our environment um mm -hmm. yeah but yeah I, I think you bring up a good point of just how do we how do these images get disseminated in a, in in different ways so um i've kind of explored masking things out obscuring but then also revealing certain data points um, this is from um, protests for the Dakota Access Pipeline in New York City in front of Wells Fargo that was actually funneling the money that was um, responsible for the pipeline that went through the Dakota Access Pipeline. So um, it's interesting to, to, to think about how certain things get covered up what information we know about as a public and what what doesn't um so that was something um within this painting i think around this time too there was just a lot of trump was already in office and there was a lot of issues going on in my hometown um at the otai mesa um detention center in san Cedro, california where people were being uh, detained um in very harsh and cruel ways. Um, and I, I think also living in Europe, I, I really missed um, going to powwows and just going to, to uh, drum circles. So this is sort of like an embodiment of that um, alienation that I kind of felt in, in Europe at the time. Do you consider these memory paintings? Yeah. So these are just some uh, photos of the installation that I did at Reichs Academy. It's like a two year residency um, where you have access to ceramics and all, all nine yards of just whatever you could imagine for an artistic practice. And it really helped my, my process grow where um, I was collaborating with my partner Heidi to start thinking about how plants could start to, this is like the beginning of 
when I was like, how could plants start to enter into my installations more? And just goofing around and you know experimenting with with how how to host life in in space too. So I think that's sort of where the imaginings of from the a flat two dimensional surface to pushing these ideas out to be more interactive began. Um, and then I was invited to do a show at Fons Velter's gallery as a result of somebody seeing that show. So I just immediately went into overdrive to just produce this show. Um, yeah, and just spent a lot of time in the ceramics facility at the Reichs Academy making a lot of ceramics, which is really nice too. So can you can you talk a little bit about this image? Because I, I was actually looking at it when you sent me the PowerPoint. And so is the door appropriated? The door yeah. and amazing windows? I know, I know. Yeah, no, it, it was part of like their tableau or their huh. uh, interior design there. And I just really wanted to interact with it rather than ignore it. And I feel like mm. that's a, that's what I really try. And I don't like to just airdrop in or call or phone in an exhibition. I really like to take my time, especially now thinking about COVID and the environment where it's like slowing down and really looking at a whole space and playing off of things has been something that's been really important uh, for my process. Um, so yeah. Um, really quick, this is sort of, you know, thinking about elections and pipelines and thinking about specifically about money. Um, one of the biggest campaign contributors to right wing causes are the Koch brothers, or, or I guess one of them is just alive right now. So um, as of like a couple of years ago, their valuation was at $115 billion. And these are some of their products that they uh, create and some of their think tanks on the left. So um, I I think it's just important to also follow money when we're thinking about um, the environment and who's responsible. And I think for a lot of time, we internalize on an individual level the change need, that needs to happen. But in reality, most of the people that are contributing to pollution in this country are like four or five people that are in charge of huge corporations with their private jets. And, you know, I think so if we just hold politicians accountable to actually you know, do the right thing for the vast majority of their voting public, we we could actually see things, at least in my naive idea of like the Green New Deal. Um, but I hope I'm not naive. But um, yeah, so these are just uh, something that I wanted to point out in reference to uh, extractionism that I was thinking about at the time. Um, this is uh, part of my final exhibit at the Reichs Academy. This is from 2018, an installation that I did in collaboration with my partner, um, where um, I was specifically starting to look at this form uh, from the Esquintle um, era of Mayan figurines, which is on exhibit, I believe right now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, where um, it's this figurine that's you know about this size and comes apart where you can see the inside and outside of a figure. And I was noticing how this idea of um, repatriating objects back to indigenous tribes. And, you know, there's no way that I could just directly take that object out of a museum, but what happens if I recreated it and then found these different lives of it going forward? So this was sort of my way of doing that. Um, here's an install shot. These are just some install shots from around the room um, of different objects that I was uh, interacting with and painting back in and having a conversation between uh, something that's observed um, out in nature very you know far away or something very direct around me um, as you know in the spirit of like Giacometti how Giacometti would kind of paint his uh, sculpture sometimes I find that really interesting. Um, and the, this work was done while you were still in Europe this particular piece? Yeah, so this one is not from observation. I was huh. projecting light from a photograph that I took of a cave from inside of a cave of like light that was like coming into a cave. So it's like kind of trying to be self-referential about thinking about, you know, the er, the contemporary artist's studio as a cave or an oculus. Mm -hmm. 
but then also how you know some of these caves if you sit there for long enough you just see like light hit the ground and move in certain ways that is really interesting um, and maybe a premonition of telescopic thinking or something or mm -hmm. telescopes um, did you when you made this work did you kind of know that it would be a catalyst for for future future experiments and future I probably did I probably did. but I, I I'm very intuitive with the way that I go I'm I'm not um yeah yeah I I like the process of making painting to reveal itself as I go rather than to just paint myself in a corner and be making only one kind of work I think the very nature of my identity of being hybrid but then also being a connection point between differences to always be engaged in creating openings for myself to keep growing as an artist. Um, but yeah, no, that's a good question too. Um, so this is around the time of this in 2018, there was the, the migrant crisis at the border, the supposed, but it's it was all kind of like a construction, I believe from failed US foreign policy that created a bunch of refugees that had to find safe harbor in San Isidro, California. So, um, and also just growing up and and giving safe safe passage to people at our home or offering whatever we could to people when we were living along the border um, in various forms that I won't go into specifics about is just something that I grew up um, with and um, whether it's kind of very obvious or, or kind of more abstract, it's kind of embedded in the work, but it also kind of grows more towards seeing, you know, the Syrian refugee crisis or also just uh, refugees from Africa that are now going along the same route as South American um, uh, refugees are. So um, yeah, I, I just something that I wanted to point out, um, but also how its connections with the reservation system in the United States has some corollaries within the US-Mexico border too. Um, so we could talk more about or the Tohono Autumn people and how that's affected them, the border walls. So, yeah. And for audience members that might not be aware, that's, that's a tribe that's directly on the US-Mexico border. And there has been uh, discussions or Posed discussions by certain certain politicians that were running in the election to uh, essentially surround the border of the reservation with federal troops. Yeah, that's really crazy. Yeah. <laughs> nope. So uh, <laughs> this was. Uh, in 2019, I had my first solo show in a gallery in, in New York City. Um, uh, so this is at uh, Bowers Lee Gallery. It doesn't exist anymore, but um, yeah, I, it was just like a great opportunity to bring all this work that I had made in Europe, but bring it back to the United States, bring it back home and, and just show all my friends and family members what I'd been up to. and. Um, so in this image too, it's like the reverse side of that last one. Um, the image that I sampled from John Quick to see Smith is on the left of this image right here. Um, and um, one of the reasons why I sampled it too was that I felt like it was like kind of like the perfect foil to think about feminine bodily trauma during like the forcible separation of minors from their parents and that epigenetic trauma that is inside of all of us as a result of American colonial project that how do we recognize these problems? How, how does it get passed down from one generation to the next? And then also just how do we overcome that too? Um, is something that I think about and try and practice within my, the way I teach my art classes is um, almost in a vein of art therapy. Um, so yeah, that's just something that I was thinking about with this, this work. And this, so 
for for me, what's interesting watching the progression of these works is this is where you sort of jump from oil on canvas to acrylic on canvas, which yeah. seems it seems like it could be you know just a, a you know quick decision to change medium for whatever reason. But with with your work, there is actually a lot of philosophical uh, underpinning to that dis decision to begin to use acrylic paints. Yeah, um, you know, I, I was talking about like the petrochemical industry and thinking about how do I be very self-reflexive or self-conscious about the very materials that I'm using, but indexing them and, and that, you know, acrylics are part of that. And how do we think about our relationship to the earth? I mean, obviously paint isn't as destructive as, you know, Koch brothers flying on their private jets throughout the world, but it's also still part of something, you know? So how do, how do I also bring about those conversations? But also I think part of it also was uh, chemically, I could do more experiments than with oil paint. With one, with my oil painting, I could just do like one layer of masking and then that's it because the acidity of the oil paint would just deteriorate um, my mask. And so from like a practical artistic level, like I could layer four to five to six different layers, almost like in Photoshop or thinking about how each layer could be a possible time frame of, of in, in, in art history or in history. And then peeling off those different layers has been kind of like my way to think about how do you break linear history or linear cartography to be more complex and I think tell our stories from America more honestly, but like less um, obviously though too. Um, uh, so this one, I, I also have to credit uh, Jean for their work because Jean, quick to see Smith did like these paintings of indigenous tribes names replacing colonial state names. So this is uh, the US-Mexico border and replacing like Pima or Apache with uh, New Mexico or Arizona or Texas. Um, and like uh, tribes from uh, Mexico too. So yeah, working this way was, was a way to think about how and where pipelines exist, but then also how movements of people are also um, ever present before there was a colonial border. Were you back in the States when you were doing doing this work? Yeah, yeah, I was between New York and then um, trying to get back to the Southwest as much as possible, mm -hmm. but mostly in New York when I was making this stuff. Um, so yeah, when I would, this is some video that my mom shot of me, <laughs> um, but this is, yeah, I just wanted to show this to you guys just to show some of my process. Um, um, so I like pre gesso my canvases. So then when I'm out painting and I'm also making sure not to leave any drops of paint or anything like that, and leave it how I found it. Um, so then if I wanna restretch it or, or do different folding or dyeing and things like that, it's much easier than if I go the route of doing like an oil painting process. Um, so there's that. And then this is sort of the result of that. Um, this is see the beauty in others um, and just building up multiple layers on top of one another. Um, and I guess, yeah, using that idea of the Oculus to be self-referential onto the process, but then also thinking about just a more empathetic viewpoint from the earth, from inside of the earth. What does so? What does the what is your relationship with a canvas for a work like this look like? You so you paint a uh, part of it out in nature, and it comes back to the studio with you. Is it is it an immediate sort of movement through the various layers, or do you do you pause and kind of come back to things? Yeah, I think it's. I'm kind of like ADD a little bit where like I, whatever kind of holds my attention kind of 
sometimes governs it through intuition and improvisation. I really am interested in, you know, how movement and ceremony can kind of register within like my, my psychological memory of how to not overly contrive things, but to just let brush or gesture be evident in the process of, of doing something. Um, so in, in some ways, it's a mixture of my own um, psychosis or whatever you want to say, um, or it's also like, how, how do I also respond to things? And um, yeah, I, I, I think let, I, I, I try not to over plan, I guess is mm. the point. Um, but then all, inevitably things from my past or whatever emerge too, but I also try and obfuscate it so then it's open enough to the viewer and the viewer can find things inside of my work that I, I hadn't planned either. Um, Um, so around this time, uh, this is work that I was starting to develop for my first show with Garth Green and Gallery um, in New York. Um, this is probably around before we are all vaccinated and we are all kind of indoors for the most part. Um, And this was like one of my first diptychs that I did using this multi-layered landscape painting approach. Um, yeah. For a work like this, is there, do you go back into nature with canvases that you have worked on in other locations? Do you, uh, or do you return to the same place with the same canvas? I, I think for this one, I kind of started out with um, the initial painting of mm -hmm. from, from, from nature, but then I brought it back into like my studio and like, you know, work it up a lot. Um, recently, I've been kind of like experimenting with uh, dyeing canvas with uh, cochineal dyes and um, then working on top of that in the landscape where I'm actually going to places that have cacti that could potentially grow uh, the cochineal beetle too. So, um, but to return to a place multiple times with that same, that would be really interesting. I'd, I would be really interested in doing that. That's a great idea. For me, looking at these works, it's, it's really interesting because so Jean Cocteau Smith is such an influence on your work. Yeah. And while you can see that, it's also interesting, sort of, to my mind, somewhat different approaches to the landscape. Orjan's written about how, for her, it's a very close up, pressed on, sort of laying down against the land view, and I'm quoting, probably paraphrasing her, her words. Uh, and for you, I think there's simultaneously very much the sort of same shared intimacy with the landscape. Uh, but it's a, I would never look at your work and say it's sort of pressed on to the earth. It's much, um, it often, often your paintings function as windows. And I know you've brought up the idea of portals in your work as well, where it's just, it is before you and the relationship it's, uh, much more visual, I suppose you could say, than than sort of physical. Mm. Yeah, I think what I really enjoy about uh, Jean's work is like a dialectic that's kind of going on of, of an accumulation of marks. And I don't know, the way that I kind of see it is how, how, how does, how do stories get told? How, how do, how do things come to the surface, but then also almost like an abstract impressionism or, or something like Philip Gustin or like um, Joan Mitchell, like how, how, how do things kind of come to the forefront and really stand and signify or, or maybe also have power by being abstract as well too. Um, I think 
you know, the, I, yeah, those are just some of the thoughts that I was reminded of with what you said. Um, I'm going to give you another little video of me in process. Um, and this is uh, for this painting on the on the left. Um, so sometimes I can't bring my big canvases into some of these locations. So I do small studies that then I project larger onto uh, some of my paintings. So this is an example of, of me doing that. And, um, yeah. And this is in New Mexico? Yep. Um, and then this one is uh, titled How Mora Banned Fracking. So uh, one of the towns that my dad is, his family is from, part of his family um, is Mora, New Mexico. And they were able to work with like lawyers to stop uh, oil and gas industries from coming in and fracking the area. And I don't know, I just think it's a small town and, and um, they, this past summer, they just suffered a lot of wildfires that had just happened. So I could only imagine if they hadn't, stopped fracking from happening, how worse it could have been. But um, I don't know, it's just really interesting that resilience that sometimes small towns can have to fight big corporations. So I, I just, I, I started the painting out in like a, a cow pasture and I really didn't like the painting and it was very not good. And then I just kept working on it in my studio and it eventually turned out to this, which I was really happy about. So. Can you talk a little about the title for this piece? Uh, yeah, um, Quantum Sunset. Um, so, you know, I, I, I like to kind of be an amateur enthusiast about science or physics and astrophysics. And um, I, I, I like ideas that can kind of predate modern science that you can kind of see within cave paintings and the way that world building would kind of happen in cave paintings, but then also maybe apply that to particle physics and how how painting could register multiple dimensions or phenomenon that are going on at different points in one picture plane too. So it's kind of like a very novice approach of trying to express something rather than to illustrate it, but I don't know. Um, so this was um, for my show with Garth that happened last year. Um, I really wanted to create like a form that kind of hosted life or, or that could kind of at least be an armature for something. So this is kind of like a premonition for uh, one of my sculptures that I'm going to show you in a moment. Um, but it was just really fantastic to work with Garth. Um, he's one of the best curators I've ever worked with with thinking about my work and being very thoughtful and conscientious about it. So um, yeah, I just wanted to show this image of it. Um, sorry, there's somebody blowing a, a, a leaf blower right now. <laughs> um, so we're almost done with the images. So I'm at the last few. Uh, thank you for bearing with me, you guys. Um, so th these are images from a show that just closed my first museum solo at Crystal Bridges Momentary Space, where um, I, I got to take that Esquintle figurine um, model uh, from the Metropolitan Museum of Art and think about how I could take it large scale to host native plants from the area that um, of Northwest Arkansas, which is uh, the indigenous home to the uh, Caddo and Osage tribe. and um, thinking about how I could, you know, take back this very industrial former chemical plant. And what was good was then it pushed the institution to actually create more green space in the area permanently. And also think about how they could be more equitable about that space going forward with um, projects and the public. So it was, it was really, this is like my first bronze that I'd ever done too. And the whole process of, of it was really, really interesting and fun. For me, it's it's so interesting too, because knowing your interest in science fiction, this kind of is, uh, I can't help but think of android-like figures and sort of the 
all of the plants have this double resonance as plants, but also they look like wiring. The concept of the of a part of a figure coming off also is a I feel like a visual concept that often gets used in science fiction movies and and things of that nature. So it's this sort of reinterpretation of it is especially with your interest in indigenous technologies is so uh, uh, just rich and kind of a great encapsulation of some of the things that that you've talked about throughout this lecture and that inform your work. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate that. Um, I mean, people like Ursula K. Le Guin or Donna Haraway are people that think like, how can sci-fi actually hold real world philosophies? And I think for me that I'm not a, a real academic in philosophy, but I still have like these impulses of, of how to confront larger issues of global warming. How can, how can art imagine those futures? And I think science fiction is a good foil to do that. And um, yeah, I mean, there's so, I'm, I actually really love science fiction a lot and thinking about how it could hold on to larger ideas and push them forward. And um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, totally. Um, just a quick aside. Yeah, there's like, this really cool monarch butterfly that and uh, that were building homes inside of the sculpture because I was really afraid that like wasps were going to build homes in it but actually what was nice were natural pollinators came in and just uh, created habitats out of the space so I feel like what would be cool would be to do this again somewhere else and to continue these processes of like taking over urban or um, industrial spaces with sculpture that could, you know, reintroduce native species back into um, environments. Um, really fast too, there's, I had a free seed bank there that had um, blazing prairie stars and echinacea that people could take home. But uh, the real thing that really helped the garden was swamp milkweed, which was really attractive for pollinators like um, the caterpillars and um, yeah, so that was really great. And we, we did workshops with uh, local um, people that showed up to our workshops to teach them about how to make pottery that could host the um, seeds to germination and then talking about um, that. And it was, it was just really nice to see people uh, go through the exhibition. And um, yeah, this is my last slide, um, but um, Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate uh, being invited to talk with you guys. Um, thank you, Anastasia. And um, yeah, I'm open to some questions. We have we have a couple of questions and we have a nice amount of time left. So um, I, let's see. Uh, I have one attendee that's asking. I'm wondering what you think the connection is between the creation of abstract images or images which contain abstractions or yours or any artists of political beliefs. In so many words, does, a, does abstraction uniquely benefit the, con, the convoyance of political philosophy? Hmm. I guess I think about it as how can, how can art hold multiple ideas at once and not be into a binary relationship of, of its realism or its abstraction or whatever. Like I, I wanna try and break a binary to be able to hold multiple ideas at once and let them talk to one another. And um, yeah, I think, yeah, so I'm wondering, I'm going to reread the question again so that I can get it, think of. I'm wondering what you think the connection is between the creation of abstract images or images which contain abstractions and your or any artist's overt political beliefs. Um, paintings will and can hold ideas. You know, I mean, you look at Guernica or you look at Diego Rivera or, or whatever 
but I also think how do how do we also create space for other voices to project their own meaning onto a piece of art as well too. Like I could have my intentions for sure, but I'm also so interested in creating space or creating portals for other people's ideas to come into it as well too. So I think of it as like an open space for dialogue rather than only being something political, but I think environmentalism in this country is seen as being political, but it's actually just something that I think we should all care about um, as people on this planet. So I don't know. Hmm. But yeah, I hope I answered your question. And we, we have another question uh, from Alicia Bell, which is why is land important to you as a Native American and what draws you to landscape? Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Yeah, I'm, so for me, you know, I'm not part of a federally recognized tribe. I'm part indigenous Mexican, part Spanish, and part um, indigenous from New Mexico, um, like a conflation of things. And I think, honestly, there's a landlessness that I experience where I I'm at home at some moments, and then at other moments, I feel completely alienated from being feeling like it's my homeland. Um, I think, especially, you know, me and Anastasia, we went to Cooper Union together in New York, and that being in the center of Lower Manhattan is completely overwhelming sometimes. Where in some moments, I just kind of wanted to imagine if I destroyed all the buildings there and turned in my imagination what that land originally looked like to like Lenape people or what would that look like you know or like thinking about a radical redistribution of space in painting too um how, how could it kind of think through as the initial stepping stone like landscape painting but then and our relationship to land but then push it further past something that we're, we're familiar with that's, um, yeah, more open for the imagination to, to think through as a thought experiment. I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, one of the things I, I noticed about your work and how the way you talk about your work specifically is you often refer to women who have been a significant influence. Uh, just in the slide, you mentioned Jean Cryptesy Smith, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin. Uh, in other uh, in other discussions that you've done, you you've mentioned your grandmother as being a significant sort of figure in your life. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the the influence of women's thought on your work? Yeah, um, I think like on my mom's side, and in certain definitely in certain parts of my dad's side, uh, like matrilineal culture was just something that I was raised with. And I, I actually feel like so stories and just ways of being were disseminated throughout just conversations at the kitchen table that I thought were so much more equitable and exciting. And I don't know, I. For me, it's it's I, I I don't look at sex in a way. Sometimes it's more just like where are the exciting ideas being talked about, mm -hmm. and I think for me, it's been looking at at all different points of view and being open to that and not always deeming and labeling people so much. But in in another respect, I think women are very undervalued in this society as valuable creators and contributors. I mean, if you look at people that are in museum collections, they're mostly white men, as opposed to like, most of the population is women. So it's like, why, why, why is that discontinuity happening right now? And why, and how could we change that? Um, so, so for me, in one, in one moment, I'm, I'm just uh, drawn to who are making like the, the coolest ideas in art, but I think imbued in me are, you know, people, like Angela Davis that my, mm. my parents were involved with and also Dolores Huerta. And um, yeah, I, I, 
yeah, I, I don't know. So yeah, it's kind of based out of um, organizing from my parents' background, but I also think that art history, that's sort of where I, I gravitate towards and, and yeah. That's great, that's great. Oh, listen, Esteban, thank you so much for joining us. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you and uh, so wonderful to, to have you discuss your work. And uh, thank you everyone that joined us and thank you for those of you that submitted questions. And uh, yeah, we will look forward to seeing you in December and thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, take care.